Hello, I'm Tony Guider. This is my New York. In his satirical and often hilarious Devil's Dictionary, Ambrose Bierce defines history as an account mostly false of events mostly unimportant. The events we cover today are anything but unimportant, yet because of egregious errors of omission, they are in large part fallacious. I'm talking about the history of the African Americans in this city and the fact that you probably do not know the vital importance of Marsania in the Bronx to that history. Fortunately, this book contains the remedy. Before the fires, an intimate portrait of the Harlem of the Bronx by the people who lived there. Its co-author is Mark Nason, professor of history and African-American studies at Fordham University. He has much to tell you. Next. Mark Nason, good to have you here. It's to talk great about this, to be here. To talk about this remarkable book. Um, I'm wondering if I ask you, I, I, I'm embarrassed. I'm from the Bronx. I didn't know any of this history, and uh, I'm somewhat embarrassed by that. I'm tempted to ask you why, but is that going to take up the whole half hour? If um, I, I, for whatever reason, the dominant image of Bronx history was this nostalgic portrait of Jewish, Irish, and Italian immigrant communities mm -hmm. that made good. And then when other groups came in, it all fell apart. That was the dominant narrative. Mm -hmm. When the African-Americans yeah. and the Latinos. But, right. But also in African-American history, the focus was on Harlem and Brooklyn. So the Bronx got left out of African-American history and African-Americans got left out of Bronx history. So I was lucky enough to be tapped in the shoulder and said, can you and your colleagues remedy both of those deficits? Well, the book grows out of the uh, uh, Bronx African-American History Project. Give us a thumbnail uh, description yeah. This of all began when Peter Derrick, who was the chief archivist for the Bronx County Historical Society, tapped me on the shoulder at a book party in 2002 and said, Mark, we have many inquiries from churches and schools mm -hmm. and community groups about African-American history in the Bronx. We don't have any information. Could you try to create a database for us? And when I started looking, there were no books, there were no dissertations. And I said to myself, we're talking about 500,000 people who were largely invisible from history. What do you do? To remedy that, you start doing oral histories. So I contacted a, a woman named Victoria Archibald Good. It's Tiny Archibald's sister, ah, who was basketball. one of my yeah. yeah my first students at Fordham in 1970, who grew up in the Patterson houses. I asked her to do an interview. She told an amazing story of when public housing was this wonderful place to grow up in in the 50s, multiracial, great services, kept clean. And we ended up publishing the interview. And then her friends started saying, when are you going to tell our stories? We've been trying to tell people the Bronx was not a hellhole for African-Americans. We had years we were part of these positive communities. So I started interviewing other people from the Patterson Houses. Then a New York Times reporter named Sarah Reimer wrote an mm -hmm. article about my research with the Patterson Houses and I started getting indignant phone calls and emails from people in Morrisania. How dare you do an African-American history project without focusing on Morrisania? That was the Harlem of the Bronx. Let's uh, locate for our viewers Morrisania, okay. where it is. In okay. The, I mean, it's sort of central. South right. South. Okay. Northern border, Cretona Park. Uh -huh. Eastern border, Southern Boulevard. Southern border, Westchester Avenue, western border, Webster Avenue. It's up on a hill overlooking the, the, the area where 3rd Avenue, Webster Avenue, where the, the railroad lines right. run. Um, so it was a largely Jewish working class 
and middle class neighborhood in the 20s and 30s. And the book uh, it covers this uh, history of this neighborhood largely from 1930 to 1960. That's so we're talking about 30 years. What was it about Morrisania that uh, enabled it to become the Harlem of the Bronx? It was the first neighborhood in New York City which accepted black uh, migrants without violence or immediate flight. It was and a fascinating story. In the Depression, 1930-31, there were a lot of landlords whose buildings had empty apartments. Some landlords in Morrisania, knowing the people, these were Jewish trade unionists and socialists who had a little bit of an anti-race. He figured, I, if I could find depression-proof black families and move them in, I can pay my, you know, uh, mortgages and the people won't, you know, go crazy and leave. And so they, they put, put up, up signs that said, we rent to select so I, colored families. And that meant Pullman porters and postal workers, mostly light skinned. And so in the mid 30s, these families moved from Harlem to Morrisania without a major out migration. Of the, and you started having the development of the single most integrated neighborhood in New York City with a high school, Morris High School, which was the jewel of that neighborhood. Um, read Colin Powell's memoir. He graduated from Morris in 1954. Morris High School. Morris High School was the single most right. integrated high school in the United States in the late 40s, early 50s. I went back to a Morris 100th anniversary reunion it, it, you could see it. Blacks, whites, Latinos, all together. Vincent Harding was the uh, valedictorian of Morris in 1948. He's a renowned civil rights leader and historian, a confidant of Dr. King. And he said the principal of that school called it a little United Nations in 1948. His story, Vincent Harding, is among the stories in the book. Uh, you 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 touched on it, uh, and maybe you've explained it. What what was it about the character of these people or this neighborhood that was so different from other urban areas in the way they treated both I mean, the inflow you, of you African Americans? Yeah, okay, here let's take and, and they didn't. You know, there was no. It's flight, a, it's an incredible said. story, and how different it was on the Grand Concourse, which was also Jewish. Black families couldn't move in until the '60s. If young black men walked on the Grand Concourse, the police would escort them off in the mm. 30s and 40s. The Arthur Avenue neighborhood it near Fordham wasn't safe for black young men to go into well into the 70s. In the, and in the 50s, there was a gang called the Fordham Baldies. I remember you, that. You know, that, uh, you know, police the neighborhood. And I, there were only a handful of black families who could move in there. You couldn't move into the Irish neighborhoods. You couldn't move to the Italian neighborhoods. You could move into this one Jewish working class neighborhood because it was the most left wing neighborhood in New York City. And, it, and so for 20 years, black people lived in racially mixed communities, attending racially mixed schools and it, was, and it wasn't just black people from the South. It was from the Caribbean and then also people of African descent from Puerto Rico and other Latin American countries. So you had this incredible mix of cultures which ended up generating more varieties of popular music than any place in the country, if not the world. And, no, and this was something we uncovered because people told stories. And they tell wonderful stories, 17 or 18 of them are in the book, um, and developed, as you, as you are saying, I mean, developed a community of strong churches, community-based, community-active churches, uh, good public schools, and for a generation or maybe a little more, this was a flowering African-American community. It absolutely it? was. I mean, you look at there, we have 17 people in the book. Of Only one of them had college-educated parents. Mm. They become professors, teachers, executives, musicians, social workers. Uh, 
And it's partly because the community, for at least some people, was an engine promoting success. You know, you had teacher mentors in the schools. Uh, you had strong churches. You had after-school centers in the schools, the night centers, where you had teachers who protected students from some of the gang activity. And as a result, a significant number of people in this community who were black were able to achieve upward mobility through school, through the arts, and through sports. And there's one point I want to make about the, the good schools. There were things our schools do better today than those schools do now. Kids who had learning disabilities were not treated very well in the New York City public schools. They were put in <clears throat> special classes. They were marginalized to a large degree. We do better with that now. The one thing those schools did better is sports and the arts. They had vibrant music programs, Every... which were finally, uh, I guess, eliminated in the 70s or something. But it's, I, I think, Professor, it's, it's almost impossible to underestimate the value and the importance of those music programs, especially in these Bronx schools, when you think of all the music that's come out of the yeah. oh my God. Bronx, uh, the South Bronx. Absolutely. Largely. Two junior high schools, Junior High School 52, which is on Kelly Street, and Junior High School 40, which uh, was just off Prospect Avenue. They each had 300 musical instruments. Mm. If you made the band of the orchestra, you wow. could take them home. You had great music teachers, some of whom were professional musicians. Eddie Palmieri, Ray Barreto come out of 52. All these great jazz musicians uh, like Jimmy Owens come out of 40. And it, it, imagine every day after school you see kids taking their musical instruments, walking home, putting them on the subway, putting them on the bus. Do we see that in New York City now? That to me is really sad uh, because uh, the music programs were largely eliminated in the fiscal crisis of the 70s. Yeah. I, I think your book pointed out that uh, the New Year's Eve program, oh. uh, one club back in 1951, one club in this neighborhood, and there were many, many clubs. The uh, What was the name of the, the three... No, Three Deuces? No, that's, that's a jazz club on 57. Okay, the, the great jazz clubs were Club 845, Club 845 and the Blue Morocco, but the Hunts Point Palace was the Apollo of the Bronx on Southern Boulevard and 163rd Street, and you had Thelonious Monk, yeah. Tito Rodriguez, Sonny Till and the Orioles, and the Mighty Sparrow on New Year's Eve 1953. Right. Think the of the, the great uh, Calypso, Calypso. Uh, uh, artist. All the and different The cultures. Frank Sinatra of the Caribbean. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, I mean, we had three. Sonny Till and the Orioles, Thelonious Monk, the, the Mighty Sparrow, Tito. I, it's, it, 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 I, I wish I had been around. To, yeah, well, no, imagine, this. remember, nobody had air conditioning. So you can imagine the music you're hearing coming out of apartments, coming out of bars. Of course. Coming... It, it was an, I call it a sonic universe. You mm -hmm. had this unique sonic universe, so people borrowed. So Eddie Palmieri's La Perfecta, the star trombone player, is a Jewish kid from the Bronx, Barry Rogers, yeah. one of the great trombonists in Latin music. Um, Joe Orange, who's in this book, was also in the trombone section. He's African-American of Eddie Palmieri's signature salsa band. That's the kind of mixture you had, and it made for great music. The question comes, and your book, of course, is called Before the Fires, and too many people have it fixed in their mind. That that's the only picture of the Bronx that they have fixed in their mind, the burning of the Bronx in the late 60s, 70s. Uh, so many positive community experiences. Uh, basically one generation, and then it's, then it's gone. Why was Morrisania so hard hit by the crime and the drugs in it, it the 60s was, and 70s? It, it, it was actually less hard hit than Hunts Point. Morrisania lost 50% of its population between 1970 and 1980. Hunts Point, 60%. Mott Haven, the same. What you had happening in the Bronx... It, See, people thought this was unique when it happened, but it happened in 30 other cities 
10 years later. A lot of this is deindustrialization when factories closed. Because in New York, it wasn't steel and auto. It was garment and, you know, food processing. A lot of those factories moved to the South in the 40s and mm -hmm. 50s. Uh, the other thing was uh, the redlining of neighborhoods by banks and insurance companies. You ha and, and then the third, urban renewal pushing very poor people into the Bronx. All three things happening at the same time. Deindustrialization, redlining and disinvestment, and urban renewal. And as a result, people panicked because it, it, the property owners couldn't, you know, collect rents. People panicked that, you know, their, their neighbors who had money were moving out. Drugs came in. And then in the 70s, you know, cuts in fire houses, cuts in police, cuts in schools. The Bronx was given up for dead. Here's the irony. The Bronx is the only place hit by deindustrialization in the United States that is completely rebuilt. Well, you go to the South, what we generally call the South Bronx today, and you'd be amazed at what you... I'm, I'm there every day. The Bronx is a great American success story. Because, look, I, have you been to Youngstown? No. North Philadelphia, Buffalo, Detroit... Uh, I've been to I've got, done the deindustrialization tour of the United States. Uh, everything that happened in the Bronx in the 60s and 70s happened to those places in the 80s. The difference, the Bronx is entirely rebuilt. Every vacant lot now has townhouses, apartments, shopping centers. And I think and even some <laughs> it's it's like I, I was amazed years ago and I went to Charlotte Street, Charlotte Street. And, you'll, and you'll see private homes. Yeah. Well, with those, little fences. Yeah. No, th those were the first. But now you have these great apartment complexes. And I even am now I'm working with this amazing organization called Wedco, Wedco. which has a, uh, a new housing complex called Bronx Commons, which will have a 300 seat music venue where they're recreating the music traditions of the Bronx, and it's called the Bronx Music That Heritage is a Center. remarkable organization, and WED, WEDCO stands for the Women's Housing and Economic Development yes. Corporation. Mm -hmm. And they have built many uh, high-rise right. towers and trying, <clears throat> excuse me, trying at least to reserve some of the apartments as legal yeah. uh, difficulties, but reserve some of the apartments for musicians in yeah. need. Well, they, Nancy Bieberman is a good friend of mine, and she, in, in, in 2006 and 2007, when we started uncovering this amazing music history of Morrisania, she had me make presentations to her staff about it. And they decided, why don't we try to bring this back? Because, you know, again, we, there are no more private clubs in the Bronx where music is, is being performed. It's only being performed at, at like universities like Hostos or Lehman. So why not have a nonprofit organization create a music venue that can encourage all the different cultural traditions which are here now, which are also bringing different times of popular music. So um, the point is, uh, this history is alive. When you find out that people can be this energized by music in the schools and in the community, why not bring it back? Where did the people go in the, di in the diaspora from the Bronx? Okay. Um, a lot of people went to the, if the Mitchell Lama housing that was built you know, in, in the 60s and 70s. Co-op City is one example. These are subsidized middle-income developments. Mm -hmm. uh, Fordham Hill is another one. That's uh, on Fordham Road just off the Major Deegan. All along the Bruckner, there are these middle-income, you know, high-rises. Uh, also to places like Mount Vernon and New Rochelle, mm -hmm. uh, to Queens. Um, to the essentially north and west in the Bronx or in the nearby suburbs is where people move. And if you go right now, the locus of African-American population is the North Bronx. Co-op City is predominantly African-American. It was once predominantly Jewish. You go along Gun Hill Road, it's, a, it's West Indian. Same with White Plains Road. And, and the same is true in, in, in Mount Vernon.
But when you talk about Co-op City and, and these other neighborhoods now that are largely African-American, I don't get the sense it's the same uh, cultural uh, oasis that Morrisania was back in those days. Well, I don't think any neighborhood in New York City is a cultural oasis. Unfortunately, I think there's all kinds of things, you know, what's happened in the schools, that you, you, there are very few music venues where you can hear live music without paying, you mm -hmm. know, large sums of money. This is, um, but I think if the schools brought the music back, we would see a flowering of a lot of creativity in, in those neighborhoods in the North Bronx because, you know, people love music. Um, and they, they, they're still trying to perform it, sing it, DJ it. Uh, they're still... Yeah. Um, sure. this, well, by the way, the, 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 most, the hottest form of popular music coming out of the Bronx today is bachata, brought by Dominican immigrants, first with this group Aventura, and then out of Aventura, Romeo Santos, who filled Yankee Stadium twice. So there still is musical creativity. It just... It, 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 the clubs aren't there. The schools aren't there in the same way. We're talking about Professor Mark Nation's book, Before the Fires, Oral History of the African-American Life in the Bronx from 1930s to the 1960s, mostly in Morrisania, and uh, an oral history, a uh, remarkable uh, story. Let's talk about some of these people. Avis Hansen, oh my English God. teacher. Uh, she was an English teacher at Morris and Taft High Schools. Her Caribbean parents, a precocious child, you know, reader, and just that. Uh, oh, my God. When I met her, she was 85 years old. Uh, one of my brilliant colleagues at Fordham is Clara, Dr. Clara Rodriguez, one of the pioneering scholars of Puerto Rican uh, history in the island of New York. She was mentored by Avis Har Hansen at Morris. So I, I go interview her, and she tells this incredible story of her parents worrying about her because they knew she was intellectually gifted in a time that women were not necessarily respected. Mm -hmm. So she was in a school in Harlem, and they come visit, and the teacher is having coffee with the principal while Avis is reading flashcards in front of the class. They come back again. The same thing is happening. She's six years old. She can read fluently. They say, I, we can't do this to our daughter. Where do you find good schools where the Jewish people live? So they went <laughs> and walked up and down the streets in Morrisania, saw a sign that said, we rent to select colored families, and moved in. And then Avis became the first black student in PS 23. And she was always the brightest student in the class. And there's this one incredible story which tells me about the spirit of Morrisania. She's in fifth grade, and the teacher resents that a black student is the smartest kid in the class. She wins the area spelling bee, but she doesn't have the car fare to go. Hmm. So the teacher says, announces, Avis won the spelling bee, but can't go because she didn't have the car fare. She says, the teacher, announced, the teacher it? announced it to the Make class. And a boy named Max, a Jewish boy who always came in overall, brown overalls and a white shirt, put his arm around her and said, it ain't no crime to be poor. Wow. That's Morris ain't here. Yeah. It wouldn't have happened anywhere else. There's uh, Paul Himmelstein. Oh, my God. He's, uh, he was, he's white, and he was the lead singer of the Heartbreakers. You can still see them on or YouTube. Put Apollo, Paul Himmelstein, and the Heartbreakers. Beautiful songs. Come back, my love. So he was one of 14 children on, on a Jewish family in Jennings Street, the last family on the street, mm. totally accepted by the community. Uh, the problem was he had a learning disability. He couldn't read. 
and school was humiliating for him. So he tells this story how he knew he was not going to be, school wasn't work, he'd have to make his living in the street, and he wasn't a tough guy. So he became a street hustler, and what he had was a gift of rhyming. So he'd deal cards or full dice while rhyming. It was like Eminem before Eminem. <laughs> and everybody knew him, you know, and he was totally accepted. Um, I mean, a lot of the people I interviewed remembered him, but it was that kind of neighborhood. Your block took care of you. God forbid somebody from your, another block come chase you onto your block. Didn't matter what your ethnicity was, people are going to come out and chase them away. Um, You've got Jimmy Owens in the book. You referred to him earlier, famous jazz trumpeter. And uh, he, he was born on East 168th Street. Oh, yeah. A couple of white families. Right. Uh, and that was a brownstone block. Uh, I, I think it's important, and you probably mentioned, but maybe we should just say it again. The Harlem of the Bronx, Morrisania, in these years wasn't... It wasn't 100 percent African American. There no. were Latinos. There were whites. Yes. Not many, but they were there. Yeah. And they didn't flee. They didn't flee. Uh, and Morris is right down the block from there. It's 166th Street and and Boston Row. So people had interacted at school and in their community across racial lines in a way that was was normalized. Uh, now they knew if you went to other neighborhoods, it wasn't the same way. They all knew you couldn't go into Arthur Avenue and you couldn't walk up in the Grand Concourse. But Morrisania was a safe zone for everybody, you know, and it also bred this intellectual excitement. I think people understood living there that they were living somewhere special because they had relatives in other places and they knew you know, mm -hmm. they'd been chased out of Cretona Park by Italians. Um, yeah. And here's the irony is that Italian-Americans took African-American doo-wop culture and, and in, enhanced it and embraced it. So that's a whole other story of the italian American Because if you look at all the great white doo-wop groups and rock and roll groups coming out of New York overwhelmingly Italian-American, large numbers of them from the Bronx. Yeah, um, and 116th Street and, and on the east side yeah. of Manhattan. But I, I take your point because I, I worked with some of these guys. I mean, they were other uh, doing, I mean, there was a great film editor at NBC in days when I was there who was also the lead singer of his own uh, doo-wop group. I went to see him once at mm -hmm. a doo-wop, and I was just, blown away by yeah. oh, the, Italian guy. Yeah, the talent level of these streets, the, 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 the Paul Himmelstein, the Heartbreakers, Dion and the Belmonts, the Chords. See, you have two groups out of Morrisania who revolutionized urban harmonic music. 1954, the Chords out of my Morris High School produced Shaboom. Yeah. The first urban harmonic song to sell a million records. I had a 45 of them. Then, 1957, the Chantels, eighth graders at St. Anthony of Padua Elementary School on 166th Street in Prospect produced the song Maybe, the mm -hmm. first urban harmonic song by a female group to sell a million records. It's been covered by Janis Joplin, a million. Right. Those, that's Morrisania. Within 10 blocks, you have, you know, Thelonious Monk and Elmo Hope, the Chords, the Chantels, Eddie Palmieri, um, and then and so much more. Yeah, uh, it, a lot of it, most of it, is in this book, "Before the Fires," by Professor Mark Nathan. Very stimulating conversation. It's a delight to have you here. Oh, it's great to have you. Uh, I mean, I followed you all these years. Didn't know you were from the Bronx. Didn't know you were following me, but. <laughs> no, I mean, when I I, I I thought it was just CUNY TV. When I realized that it was Tony Guida, that's a well an honor. Thank you so much. Okay. And uh, thank you for watching. We will see you next week.